Welcome to Breaking Banks. Shamir, I don't know if you remember this, but actually our very first interaction, Matt Harris had introduced us. Um, you were following you know, the Perk Street path to do a deal with Bancorp and you had some questions around working with them. And it was a delightful hour to actually kind of be on this road towards, hey, let's go try and reinvent how banking works. Now to have, you know, a fellow journeyman on, you know, that path, what we were doing. But I still remember the last thing Dan and I mentioned to you and Josh was, you know, by the way, like compliance is going to have an issue with you guys being called Bank Simple. And I'm curious, and you eventually rebranded, it was a brilliant rebrand as just simple, but I'm curious how that conversation went down. So we kind of all, I, I, I don't remember exactly when we talked, but we were, I was probably already aware of that issue at that point, right? Uh, not when we originally picked the brand, but by the time we, we spoke to you, um, we, you know, I, I was aware of the, the problem around the usage of the word bank. And, uh, and funnily enough, the, we, the first thing we wanted was just simple.com. That was our first choice, but it just wasn't available uh, in 2009 for like, guys with like you know 100k of seed funding angel funding i should say um and uh so we didn't get, we couldn't get simple.com and we were like all right let's just call ourselves back simple uh we actually got a cease and desist from the new york the, it's now the new york dfs it was the new york state regulator it had a different name back then um about using the word bank simple and this was before we had even launched, this was like late 2010. And so it caused such so much grief. Uh, and I'm thankful that we had already closed our series A round and they sent us the, uh, the cease and desist like a few weeks later, otherwise it would have, might have freaked the VCs out. Uh, yeah. But our lawyer sent back a nice uh, letter to New York saying, well, you, you say that it's, uh, it's illegal to use the word uh, bank, but it's, we, we aren't actually doing anything. And, uh, and, uh, and then it was nicely worded saying just, you, you don't, given that we don't have a product, you don't have anything to complain about. And, and then and the New York regulator never responded to that, but it was just, Interesting. Push, Interesting. it was just a push for us to, uh, to kind of, uh, realize that we, we needed to do this. The first place we ran into it was when we tried to, uh, to get our, uh, you know, get incorporated, and Delaware wouldn't, uh, uh, Delaware wouldn't allow Simple Bank. And then when we tried to get this certificate of doing business in New York, that's where we, we kept running into this. And that's why the name of the company was Simple Finance Technology, because mm -hmm. that was the one that could actually get incorporated easily. Uh, and we were like, Simple Bank didn't work, Bank Simple didn't work, and all of these were rejected, right? So that's our that was our first run in with it. Uh, it kind of worked the way we wanted it to, right? We want, always wanted to be simple.com. We finally got to it. It just ended up taking a lot longer and taking a lot more money and uh, with a lot more heartache along the way. But isn't that always the case? Absolutely. I, I, I'll jump in Shamir, here because, um, you know, I mean, you, I and Josh had this conversation actually with Josh. Um, we actually dived into how we could possibly do it. And we had this, uh, you know, I, I took this to CFPB and the CFPB said, yeah, I think I think that would work, but I'm not sure the feds are going to agree. And in the in the end, uh, it wasn't the feds that gave us the issue for Moving Bank. It was the state regulator in Kansas with CBW. But um, Josh and I talked about um, creating a, um, a copyright or trademark brand and licensing that to the partner bank, uh, in your case, Bancor, uh, in our case, CBW, licensing it to them. And so they were the ones that were actually issuing a card with the Move and Bank trademark on it. Um, and in the end, they, uh, um, you know, because we had this uh, note from CFPB saying that that would be, would be fine as long as we kept the relationship, um, you know, contractual relationship in place. So, and uh, the state regulator said, well, if the CFPB said it's okay, then we're definitely not okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> and well, then I mean, go, Dara, right? as our resident legal opinion, you know, what's the big deal? So, unfortunately, I think this is really a perfect example of regulatory form over substance. Um, and 
regulators really like their forms. They live and die by their forms and their rules and, you know, what fits into what fits into the box. And part of that is born out of necessity, because if a regulator doesn't stick to those very sort of stringent standards, it becomes a very slippery slope because if everything has an individualized and case by case analysis, you make one type of exception for one entity, then the next entity that comes along, they want a different type of exception. And then, you know, uh, chaos ensues. Uh, I think that there is oftentimes so much more attention paid to the form rather than the substance. And the law is sort of written that way, unfortunately, particularly if you look at something like UDAP, where a certain practices, you don't even need to demonstrate any sort of consumer confusion or harm. Um, but I mean, it, the lawyer in me wants to say, bank is a familiar term. I understand why you want to use it because it provides a level of familiarity to your customers and keep it simple, stupid. But, it, but on the other part, it's just like, if you're not a bank, like don't call yourself a bank. Like if you don't hold a law license, don't call yourself a lawyer. If you can't practice medicine, don't call yourself a doctor. But, uh, but you, you, but, know, but but you, you can a, be practicing banking. You can yeah. be practicing banking without being a, uh, you know, you could be a banker practicing banking in a tech startup sitting on top of a bank's t stack, right? And, and this is I, it's really you, interesting. You could, except the laws aren't written that way. Right. Well, so the the, the laws here that, and, and it's funny because I saw this pre Dodd Frank and then a little bit post Dodd Frank, right? The laws here are actually state laws. Uh, there isn't a federal law, as far as I'm aware, that I haven't read uh, Dodd Frank, but there's no federal law saying that you can't use the word bank in a name. This is all like state laws, uh, which were really created in like the late 19th century, most of them. And these were to prevent the situation where, like, you know, two hucksters show up in a town somewhere in the uh, West and they set up a so-called bank of uh, XYZ town, take a bunch of deposits and then hightail it out of there, right? Um, Good business so, model. <laughs> maybe, in the, in, maybe in the 1880s. I, I don't think it's... Uh, uh, and, and that was a time period when there was very little regulation of banking overall and what regulation... I mean, this was pre-Federal Reserve. This was pre... Uh, it was all... OCC at some level trying to control like the circulation of greenbacks and and then it was all states right so the states put in these laws just like the money transmitter laws but it comes from that same time frame um, and they've mostly they've basically been like unused I think up and for a pretty long time until this latest wave of fintech came along because it's exactly the problem that you said Brett which is that it it, it if a you know it, it's it's like, it's hard to practice medicine without being a, a doctor, right? Uh, I mean, it, it, and it, it makes sense so that is that would be clearly illegal. Uh, but for all of us, right, whether it's simple, whether it's Perk Street, whether it's moving, every single thing that we were doing was completely legal. There was no doubt about it. And the customer funds were completely protected. Uh, customers had better experiences and loved the product more. I would argue that simple was a way better bank uh, and same with Moven and Perk Street than Bank of America ever was. And yet the regulators Damn protect straight, Bank of America's right to be called a bank more than simple or Movens or Chimes for that matter. So, so, so here's, a here's, form over substance. here's a really interesting, here, here's a really interesting discussion we had on the eighth anniversary show um, where Ron was talking about this, Ron Shevlin and, um, and uh, was you Jason or JP? I think it was JP. And um, he said, what do you call a Chime account? If it's not an account, you know, like this, this sort of really this functional view of banking, the real issue that's coming out here is that the, the legal framework hasn't caught up with what, how we can deliver banking services operationally and technically, but Dara back to you. Well, so I want to make sure that listeners are clear that we're sort of talking about two different sets of sometimes competing regulations, right? You have got the state level rules, um, and this is just a very sad commentary our, on our entire financial services regulatory structure that it's so fragmented the way that it is. So you've got all of the state regulators, and you're right. It is the state. If, if the state is regulating you as a bank, they are the ones that have the very sort of specific granular rule that only banks get 
and chartered banks get to call themselves banks. There is no federal rule on it. The federal regulatory structure is actually far broader because you have regulators like the FTC under the FTC Act and the CFPB under Dodd-Frank, um, the DOJ, if it gets serious enough, that say very broadly, we don't need any specific rules. If we think any of the things that you're doing, whether it's the marketing that you're using, the, the language that's in your agreements, what have you, if we think it's unfair, if we think it's deceptive, if we think it's abusive, regardless of whether or not there's a, a black and white rule against it, we're going to get you. That's their rule. That's the, that's the framework that, that everyone is under, regardless of what state you're doing business in, if you fall under uh, a covered person under these acts. So you're actually dealing with it times two. You have to please the state regulators and simultaneously please the federal regulators. And you can be in perfect compliance with state law and still get tagged with a UDAP. It and sucks, uh, but that's, that's what it is. Yeah, and, and, but I totally agree uh, on that one, Dad. I think you, uh, you hit the nail on the head. In my experience, though, the federal regulators are actually much easier to work with precisely because they have that broad discretionary authority like the CFPB under the under Dodd Frank is set up to protect consumers and go after anybody who's harming consumers and th there is basically no argument the people who are harming consumers in this space are like Bank of America and Chase if you want to go after anybody tell them to stop calling themselves a bank right so the, 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 the but the, the the law the way it's written at the state level is if you don't have a bank license you can't call yourself a bank uh, this has nothing to do with consumer protection. It has everything to do with the behemoths leveraging the relationships to try and crush big banks. And I think that's really a really critical point. If the regulator was there first and foremost to support the customer and reduce market risk, the most sensible thing to do would be to legislate or create fintech banking charters. And that's what's happened in almost every other developed nation in the world. The reason it hasn't happened in the United States is because of lobbying groups vested in interests and their, you know, and the the incumbents association with the uh, the regulators, which is, it, it, you know, that that's at the heart of this conversation is why shouldn't Chime be able to be a, a bank? Well, they should be able to go through a modern process of getting a fintech charter like you would in the UK, Singapore, Hong Kong, the EU, Australia, you know, et cetera, et cetera. India. Malaysia, <laughs> India, you know, China. Um, that's how the rest of the world has dealt with this. The real question is why hasn't the US done that, you know? Well, Jason, I seem to remember you and I sitting across the table from a particular regulator in a particular state with a particular set of lawmakers arguing that exact point. Um, said state and regulator shall remain nameless for for the purpose of protecting <laughs> Jason and I. Uh, but oh, but, come on! <laughs> I like them to uh, still but, like me. <laughs> uh, fine, fine. I, I mean. We've had this, I mean, I feel like we've had this conversation over and over. And the difference is, is that it's not the regulators who are writing the laws. It's our politicians who are writing the laws, divesting certain authority to the regulators. The regulators can only write rules within the specific set of uh, authority that's been delegated to them under the laws. And 99% of the time, the lawmakers who are writing the laws have little to no appreciation or understanding for the industry that they're writing laws about. Um, and God bless America. Like, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what else to say about that. Well, no, I mean, that's exactly right, right? Like, it's the fractured nature of US politics that underlies this mess. In, I, I think right. it's both the fractured nature, but also where we're going to find ourselves in trouble is, you know, I, you know, listen, I don't think if you're not actually a regulated entity, you should be making claims that you are. And we can argue, you know, as many have, and Dara just you know, highlighted, you know, we need to therefore change the regulation. I would go a step further and say, we need to change the pace of regulation and the adaptability, as well as even our stance to you know, today, you know, look at why did Dodd Frank come into being? Some really bad stuff happened. We then go, let's do like a massive overhaul, this monumental piece of legislation to change it. 
that took forever to you know, first write and then took forever to implement. And meanwhile, no one's got their eye on the ball of all the other bad stuff and market evolution that's going on in the first place. Yeah, and this is where you know the 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 the, 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 pro- the part of the problem here in the U.S. is that it has this. It's a massive country, uh, and it also has a very federal structure, right? India, for example, is also massive, but uh, the the financial regulation all happens at the central level. It's really coming out of Delhi and then the RBI in Mumbai, right? That's not the case here. You have to to make change happen. You can't just pass laws at the federal level. You also have to think through the state implications and 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 the way that that framework works. And and this is specifically one of those things. I I don't think I don't think the CFPB or any federal regulator was even mentioned in this whole Chime Bank. Uh, California nonsense, right? Uh, it was just some major bank, I suspect some one based in California, leaned on the California regulator to go after Chime for something that's a total nonsense. Exactly. And, and I think the, the point of consumer protection is, is well taken, right? Like the, the, uh, the, 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 there's this fallacy that, you know, the, like Chime and Simple and Move and are not regulated uh, or, or Perk Street for that matter. They, we were not directly regulated. It's not like you know the, the regulators would come in and do audits of simple. I don't think they did that on Perk Street either. At the same time, there, all of us had to comply with all the regulations. The banks imposed it on us. And as we got bigger at Simple, we had a lot of direct interactions with regulators. Whenever Bank Corp had an audit, for example, and we had internal audit teams and compliance teams. And, and we, at least at Simple, would have welcomed being directly regulated. It would have cut out a layer of like, uh, you know, intermediation that from Bancorp, which would have been helpful to directly explain what's going on rather than send stuff to Bancorp, who then sends it to the FDIC or wherever. Um, and, uh, but the thing is that, that that cannot happen the way it has happened in the past, right? In, in, the, in 2010, if Simple had applied for a bank license, we would probably have gotten it like in 2021. Uh, and so that, that pace of change, the way that that worked, the, that, that just doesn't work for some uh, folks like us. And so we would love to be directly regulated with a framework that makes sense, right? And the US regulatory framework is optimized. I don't know whom it's optimized. It's definitely not optimized for the customers. I suspect it's optimized for the banks of America. Well, in, yeah. you know, there's an interesting analog here. If you were to go public on the AIM in the UK, their approach when you're below a certain size is you actually have to have an investment bank, you know, kind of acts as your regulated entity, you know, you're a sub-regulator, if you will, which allows, you know, these smaller companies that um, the FCA wouldn't be able to, you know, to really directly regulate effectively and as quickly enough, you know, and it works. Maybe that's the approach, right? Is do we actually formalize the banking as a service you know, system to be broader than, you know, it still kind of does work a bit with, a, you know, a nod and a wink, it, you know, frankly, in terms of how some of this works. And, you know, Shamir, you, you and I and move in and like the folks at Smarty Pig were some of the first to kind of go do the, hey, listen, we're going to comply with the regulation, but we're just going to wedge in just a little bit like this to be, to be different. You know, maybe that's the place to go rewrite it. You know, we we, uh, we tried a few things in the early days we just couldn't do because regulation. Um, with Movin, you might recall we had CredScore. Um, and with CredScore, what we were going to offer was a variable or dynamic interest rate, both on credit and on savings. So, for example, if you're, a, you know, a, an influencer on social media and you recommend us, uh, then that would get you and, and people sign up for moving accounts, that would get you a better interest rate on your savings account or a lower interest rate on your credit facility. The CFPB, when we went to them, said you can't do that because you have to have the same savings rate for every customer that's in the regs. And we're like, that doesn't really make any sense. Could we challenge that? And they were, and you know, and and to their credit, they were like, "Give us a proposal. We'll we'll take a look at it." Um, but the really thing that struck me as um, you know, sort of very uh, 
bound in the regulations is that that, that a, when when giving access to credit or access to savings, the regs had been written around traditional product structures that were available in the branch. And the more and more you started to play with that on the digital front end side, the more likely you were going to break regs because that wasn't necessarily the most efficient way or the best way to give customers access to the utility of the bank, right? Yep. Yeah. I mean, these were all written in a time when math was hard, right? Yeah. Like the idea that you would on the fly calculated different daily interest rate for every customer would have been insane before like 1990 for anybody. <laughs> now it's like, yeah, a good programmer can code that in a few weeks. Uh, and so is that, a, is that a bad thing? And the answer is not necessarily. Uh, it all depends on how the product is designed. Well, and I think that that begs like the neck, the extension of that sphere, not only was it not possible and therefore we didn't think about it, you know, reality, if we look at the products that exist today that are offered by the Neo or Challenger banks, most of them are just digital versions of products that already exist today. What happens when we cross that next scale, right? And we enter into just like the, you know, the crypto wars on, is it really a currency? Is it actually regulated? Should it be taxed when you buy and sell? When we get to that next um, iteration of what financial products look like, we're going to be in even deeper trouble. Yeah, yeah, even experientially, we see it with buy now, pay later right now. And there's a lot of pushback against that. But essentially, I don't think people understand the significance of that because what we're doing is we're now saying you don't need to... Um, go to a bank to access credit separately from your purchasing process right yep. and that's always how banks have broken up oh you want to buy a home great you can go and look at a home but you can't buy a home until you come to us and we make sure you're not too risky and we decide if we're going to give you a mortgage product um you know and 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 i think that's where you know when we look at experientially the utility of banking embedded in the world around us this ability to buy your peloton bike or go on a cruise if people still do cruises or whatever it is and 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 just access credit in in the purchase moment is a massive shift in the way we think about distribution you know and um, that's only going to get increasingly variable and co more complex and so those rules that used to say the only way you can get credit is at a bank and this is the interest rates well this is how you should publish interest rates and 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 you have to do it through a branch because of CRA you know, you have to maintain branch infrastructure because of the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977, et cetera, all needs a, needs a revamp. Now, Dara, uh, you know, I want to throw this at you, but I think the opportunity here to sort of, um, you know, greenfield this regulation space is, is, is minimal in the US unless you start thinking about encoding those regs in AI, in a code base, because at that point, it's logical that you want to redesign regs for this sort of 21st century operation. Do you hear anyone sort of talking about that redesign of regulation as we digitize that and automate it? So I think part of, so I have heard discussions about that. Um, I actually think, uh, Jason, who are we talking with? I think we were talking with Joanne uh, Barefoot uh, about yep. that probably most recently. Here's... I don't want to say a problem because I'm like a solutions oriented person. Um, I would say a struggle uh, that we will have sort of moving forward. Regulations and the ability of a regulator to write rules and regulations under any specific law in the U.S. is directly delegated to them under whatever statute is drafted by Congress. There is a massive inconsistency about the way that authority is delegated to various regulators in the U.S. And because even at the federal level, our regulatory structure is so fragmented, right? There's this massive overlap between the CFPB, for example, and the FTC and certain powers under the FTC Act that the Federal Trade Commission um, has to oversee versus the CFPB. CFPB is the one writing the rules and regs theoretically, because that's the authority they were given under Dodd-Frank for ECOA and the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act and TILA and so on and so forth. But the FTC still has enforcement authority 
but no rulemaking authority. So you do have sort of this fragmentation and inconsistency. So unless every regulator, particularly at the, we'll leave the states to the side for a second, because that's, that's a Gordian knot that I don't, that we don't have time to untangle uh, right now. But even at the federal level, you'd have to get a consensus amongst every financial regulator, the CFTC, the SEC, the OCC, the CFPB, the FTC, et cetera, that they would want or be willing to do that and that there would be some consistency by Congress in the way that delegation of authority was was gifted to those individual regulators. That's step one. If in some like magical fairyland where like everyone's like taking the blue pill instead of the red pill, whatever, Mm -hmm. whatever matrix universe that we're in right now, and we can do that, then I think, Brett, what you're talking about is truly possible um, and I think would be massively helpful. But I think that's challenge number one. I, I feel like in some ways, uh, we missed an opportunity in this pandemic, right? Absolutely. Last time around, the, when the financial crisis hit in 08, it was very clearly a financial crisis. It, was, it came out of the financial system. Um, and the Fed just didn't move now in hindsight, nearly as fast as it could have, nearly as aggressively as it could have to to kind of arrest the the crisis. The Chinese government did actually and and managed to have a uh, much milder uh, uh, crisis in in China. Um, They stored up problems for themselves later on. Uh, But the, the, the end result of it was that there was a lot of focus on, hey, we need to fix the financial system. And that's where we got Dodd Frank, right? Now, sadly, Dodd-Frank ended up being mostly focused on fixing the old financial system because that's what we had in 08, right? Uh, it didn't really do anything for the new financial system because nobody was aware of it. Now people are aware of it. And I, and, and, but uh, I mean, I guess in this kind of framework, unfortunately, the Fed was super aggressive in March and April of last year. Uh, do in, in kind of pumping money into the markets and making sure that the pandemic didn't cause a financial crisis. So now nobody's talking about like, hey, we need to fix the financial system and pass a massive new bill. There's no political will. And so it doesn't look like we're going to get that, uh, uh, you know, the stars to align that way, Dara. No, but don't worry. They sent out a, an, a request for information in late March <laughs> asking the financial services industry what they think about AI and like, is AI hard? Thanks. Like, t- t- tell us what tell oh, us what you think goodness. about that. Yeah. That that's the step that we're at right now. Yes, yes. I have a I have a quick story, Shamir, to finish off on before we um, go to break uh, or close out the show. Um, so, um, when, you know, we went through the same thing. We had Move and Bank, and we had to change, and we were debating what it was. And uh, obviously, you know, we we came up with with Move in the end, but. Um, uh, trying to get the domain for moving was pretty difficult. We couldn't find anyone who could broker a deal. Um, the a motion capture company associated with a gaming platform had bought the domain. The gaming platform was in um, receivership. And so, you know, in, in the end, um, uh, I reached out to a lawyer from this organization, a corporate lawyer from this organization on LinkedIn and bought the domain moven.com from them for five thousand dollars oh you got so lucky (laughs) i did i did i did and so that was one thing where it just was an absolute win and i remember very specifically uday on the board call and he said don't tell josh and shamir because for what they paid for simple.com they'll be horrified we, we paid uh, we paid like a hundred x more than that. Yeah, yeah. We paid, uh, and it was so funny because we actually got into a little bidding war for Simple dot com, uh, and then we Josh was at a, I think he was at a conference, and he ran into an investor who was an investor in Simple and was chatting with him, and and that's when they put together that it was another company of that investor's portfolio who had been bidding against us. And so that investor was like, yeah, we just lost out on this domain name sale for this company. And, and, and Josh was like, yeah, we just won out on this domain name sale. And we are like, damn it, if we had only known, yes. <laughs> we could have probably gotten the price much lower instead of bidding against each other. Yeah. Well, you can walk like a bank, you can talk like a bank, but you better not call yourself a bank. And so that's a wrap for uh, this segment on Breaking Banks. Thanks for joining us, Shamir and Dara. Awesome.
Thank you for Bye. having us. That's it for this week. If you like the show, make sure to give us a five star rating on your favorite podcast platform or share it with a friend or share it on social media. We'll see you again next week with more Breaking Banks. <laughs>